So now it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce the first technical speaker of today. It is Pro Professor Serge Eroche from the Collège de France and from the École Normale Supérieure in, in, in Paris. Uh, Dr. Eroche was born in Casablanca, Morocco. He moved to Paris as a, uh, as a child, uh, received his undergraduate education at École Normale Supérieure. Uh, he did his PhD work under the supervision of Claude Contenugi. Uh, and dressed state analysis played a key part of his PhD thesis. His thesis was technically given by Paris Cis, Cis, uh, because ENS, as I understand, does not award PhD degrees. Uh, after this, uh, and not irrelevantly to why we're here today, he became a postdoc in the group of Art Shallow at Stanford University. Uh, later in his career, he worked on many topics, super radiance being one, and, a, and especially a cavity quantum electrodynamics, cavity QED as we call it, and his work in this area led to his being awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year uh, 2012. So please help me welcome Professor Aroche uh, to our symposium. Thank you very much, Bob, and thank you, Paul, for inviting me to this symposium. I'm very happy to have an opportunity to pay tribute to uh, uh, Towns and to Art Shadow. As you mentioned, I was a postdoc with Art back in the 1970s. It was my first uh, work outside the lab in which I got my PhD, and I have very fond memory of this time. It was a very exciting time for, for laser physics, the beginning of laser spectroscopy, a field to which Art Shalou has cont contributed a lot, and uh, it was a, also a good time in my personal life. Art was a wonderful man, not only a scientist, but also a human being. He was full of humor and gave me a lot of good advice, not only during that time, but later on, because I, I, uh, uh, myself and my wife, we uh, were very good friends of Art Shalou, and Aurelia Shalou was the sister of, of uh, Charles Towns. I think it's a good opportunity to talk about lasers, of course, because uh, lasers have played a very important role in physics, and during the last 50 years, they have uh, allowed us to make wonderful uh, physics and wonderful experiments in all kinds of fields in physics and chemistry, and I would like to uh, put this in perspective. I think it's also a good opportunity to talk about light in general. As we have seen, uh, this year is the International Year of Light, and I would like to recall first why we celebrate the, uh, light this year. It turns out that this is, by coincidence, the anniversary of many discoveries which have been essential uh, to understand light and its mysteries. 1,000 years ago, uh, the Arab scholar al Hazan has written the first theory of optics in which he described light rays and made uh, clear that light was not coming from the eye to the object, from, but from the object to the eye. Uh, 200 years ago, Augustin Fresnel, uh, after Thomas Young, may, uh, uh, claimed that light was a wave and a transverse wave, which was oscillating perpendicularly to its propagation. And we had to wait 50 more years, of course, to understand the nature of this wave. Uh, light was an electric and magnetic field propagating in space at the velocity of light, of course, and this is Maxwell's equations. And then reflecting on Maxwell's equations and on what they mean really and what means the velocity of light, Einstein de uh, developed the special and then general theory of relativity, and we are celebrating the 100th anniversary, 1915, which was the birth date of T Charlie Towns, too. Uh, and then 50 years later, Penzias and Wilson discovered serendipitously the black body radiation background by trying to clean a radar antenna, which gave a lot of noise, and they didn't understand this noise, and it turned out that it was a black body background, uh, which plays such an important role to understand the origin of the universe and gave a great impulse to cosmology. And back in the 1965, 
Charles Cao, a Chinese engineer working in England, developed the ultra-transparent fibers, which coupled to lasers were the origin of the uh, network of the, uh, the optical networks that we use for the internet, for instance. So these are very interesting years, and it turns out 1965 is also very important for me because it was the year I started my own uh, career in physics. And uh, I had the luck to work in the lab of Kastler and Brossel. This is a picture which was taken in 1966 on the day uh, Kastler got the Nobel Prize in Physics for optical pumping. He developed methods to use light in order to manipulate uh, atoms, to put atoms in uh, states which are not in thermal equilibrium. This was called optical pumping. It was using not lasers at that time, we were using spectral lamps classical light, but then, of course, uh, optical pumping was extended uh, with lasers. And uh, on this picture, uh, you can see Claude Cointanoji, who was my thesis advisor and who was a student of Alfred Kastler. On the right, you can see Jean Brossel, who was a colleague of Kastler and was really uh, uh, the man who did the experiments about optical pumping. And I was amazed to, to be in such an environment and to find uh, myself in a place where uh, such good physics was being made. Of course, lasers were already around, and we knew that lasers were announcing exciting time for physics, but we could not imagine the magnitude of the progresses this new tool would bring. In fact, one can say without exaggerating that we have won about 10 orders of magnitude in many domains, uh, and when 10 orders of magnitude is, of course, a quantitative statement, but when we get into these numbers, it becomes qualitative, and a lot of things which could not imagine could have been done since. Uh, of course, one of the great uh, scientists that we have to remember is Einstein, not only for relativity, but also because uh, he uh, had the idea of stimulated emission. It was the beginning of uh, quantum physics, and uh, the first theory of the atom have found that atoms, when they are excited, come back to uh, their ground state by a quantum jump, I and mean, photon, this is spontaneous emission, but by studying the, the interaction with light, with matter, and trying to understand uh, the equilibrium of light and matter, the, what is called the black body radiation, Einstein had to, came to the idea that on top of spontaneous emission, when the atom was excited and when he was interacting with photons which had the right frequency, uh, there was another process which was called, which he called stimulated emission, uh, which uh, made the atom emit preferentially in the mode of the light which was coming in. So one photon triggers the emission of a second photon and so on. And this is the amplification of light, which is of course a process used in the laser. So the recipe to build the laser is to have a lot of atoms that you excite by a process, which can be uh, light or uh, an electric discharge, for instance. And so the first photons are emitted spontaneously, and then the light is amplified when it's going back and forth, for instance, between mirrors. You have to build up a cavity. And if one of the mirrors is slightly transparent, you get a light beam getting out, and this is a laser beam. This is very easy to say now that we know how it works, but of course, uh, it took 40 years from Einstein to Towns, and the first lasers were not working, as you know, in the optical domain, but in the microwave domains, they were called masers. And this is a picture which shows Towns and his student Gordon, who built the first microwave amplifier. It was, uh, the medium was ammonia molecules, and it was an atomic beam that you can see on the picture. Uh, the uh, population of the excited state was achieved by the simple stern garlach method, which prepares the atom in one spin state in one a magnetic state, and then these molecules went into a cavity which was resonant with microwave transition, and the system started to oscillate. Uh, I want to say that uh, this is uh, uh, this comes from the work which was performed at Columbia in uh, Rabi's group. Uh, towns came to work at Columbia, and Columbia was well known for the molecular beam method, which was method that Towns used. And Rabi was, of course, the grandfather of all these technologies, not only of the laser, but also of the atomic clock and uh, of uh, NMR. And uh, these methods were also helped a lot by the technological development 
during the war, the technology of the radar and the microwave technology. I have attended a lecture by Gordon a few years ago in which he said that while he was trying to build the maser, Rabbi used to come in the lab and explain him why it would not work. And the same happened with Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr visited his lab about 10 years before he died and tried to explain why theoretically the maser and the laser would not work. So you have, uh, this is an advice to young students, you have not to listen too much to what famous people say because they can make, they can make mistakes. So once the maser worked, of course, the next step was to try to do it in the optical domain. And here comes uh, Arthur Shallow, who, work with, who worked with Charles Towns. And they wrote a famous paper in 1958 called The Optical Maser, in which they explained how you can pump atoms and what kind of cavity you need. And it was the beginning with the fabri perot cavities. In fact, Towns had come to Paris to work with Kastler. Uh, before I was a student there in, back in the 50s because he saw that one method to achieve uh, the population inversion would be to use optical pumping. In fact, it's not the way it worked. And the first, as you know, the first laser was uh, uh, developed by Theodore Mayman. It was a ruby, a solid state laser pumped by a flashlight. It was a pulse laser. And then a few months later, the first CW laser, gas laser, was built by Ali Javan. It was a helium neon laser. Uh, emitting continuously in the red. So this is his story, but since then, as you know, the laser has been developed into all kinds of forms. It's a fantastic uh, tool, and I call it tamed light because as opposed to ordinary light in which atoms emit in independently from each other, a light which has a lot of stochasticity in it, there all the atoms emit in the same beam, and it's a light beam which has absolutely extraordinary properties, and. Uh, now it sounds familiar that you can have lasers like this uh, uh, laser pointer, for instance. But uh, back in the 50s, it was really a miracle to have a light beam like that. And the properties are really contradictory. Uh, the light beam can, at the same time, heat matter at extraordinarily high temperature. You can, if you focus an intense laser beam on a piece of matter, you can heat it to millions of degrees and produce situations which occur inside stars and initiate nuclear reactions. But at the same time, you can use intense laser beams to cool matter at extraordinary low temperature, reach the coldest objects in the universe, realize Bose-Einstein condensation, for instance. In another domain, lasers can be ultra stable. You can have light beams which oscillate without skipping a bit over millions of kilometers, which means that you can use interferometric method to measure distances within one micron over huge distances. And in the time domain, you can count this oscillation of light and realize atomic clocks which keep time with a precision of a few seconds in the edge of the universe. So very steady and uh, continuous wave, but you can also uh, concentrate light into bullets of light, which are a few tenths of angstrom long and which last a few, uh, uh, a few tens of attoseconds. So this is absolutely extraordinary, and this leads to a lot of experiments to study the properties, uh, fast phenomena in atoms, molecules, and solids. And here I, I'm talking only about basic research, blue sky research. Of course, light has, uh, laser has been very useful in a lot of application in medicine, in communication, and so on, but I don't have time to talk about that. I will concentrate on research. And uh, what I want to say is that you can, uh, in fact, uh, divide the history of the laser into uh, decades. The first decade was uh, the 1960s. It was the birth of the laser and using it to perform optical pumping. At that time, laser had fixed frequencies and it was very difficult to use them in precise spectroscopy experiment. Then came the tunable lasers and a lot of high resolution laser spectroscopy methods were developed in which you can beat the Doppler effect and, and find the natural width of the atomic and molecular levels. This happened uh, in particular in the lab of Art Shallow and Ted Hench in Stanford, and I had the luck to, to be there when this development occurred in the 70s. Then in the 1980s, the laser cooling of atoms came, and uh, also the beginning of cavity QED, which studies the properties of atoms and photons inside cavities protected from the outside environment. And it was also the beginning of ion trap physics, and I will say more about that later. 
Then in the 1990s, quantum information developed. The fact that you can use the manipulation of single atoms or single ions to store information, not in a classical way, but in a quantum way using state superposition and entanglement. It was also the beginning of the Bose-Einstein condensation and also the development of ultra-fast laser technology. Then the year 2000, all this became even more sophisticated and uh, atomic physics made connections with condensed matter physics. Instead of using real atoms, artificial atoms like Josephson junctions in circuits could be used to manipulate uh, quantum superposition. Atosecond physics, of course, developed in this, in this decade. And uh, I think it was a very interesting time, and we are in a very interesting time, because atomic physics is meeting a lot of other fields, as I will say a little bit later. Uh, now, to come back to my initial uh, statement that uh, about orders of magnitude, I will give you a few examples here. Uh, in terms of precision of spectroscopy experiment, in the 1960s, uh, making a measurement with eight digit, 10 minus eight, uh, was considered already very good. And this corresponds to a clock which would be stable within one second in a year. Now we are talking about spectroscopic methods which allows us to achieve a precision of 10 minus 18, that is one second in the age of the universe. So it's 10 order of magnitude. Sensitivity of measurements. Uh, uh, in the 1960s, if you had a, a, a cell containing a low pressure gas, you were working with 10 to the 10 atoms at a time, and it was already considered as, as a very dilute medium. Now we are working with single atoms or single photons. Again, 10 orders of magnitude. Temperatures. Uh, at Temperatures were between one, uh, room temperature is 300K. If you cool down to 1K using liquid helium, it was considered as be being very cold. Now we are talking about 10 minus 10 Kelvin temperatures in the Pico uh, Kelvin range. So it's again this huge order of magnitude. And now about speed and time res resolution. Flashlights, uh, if you achieve one nanosecond, it was considered as a tour de force now, of, uh, we, you know that you can reach the attosecond level. And I could go on and on. I could talk about the intensity. If you concentrate the, the solar light on a, on a few square centimeters, as in a sun furnace, you get kilowatts per square centimeter. Now we are talking about 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 22 watts per square centimeter. So now it's not 10 orders of magnitude, but 15 or 16 orders of magnitude. So. Let's say a few words about temperature. This is a log scale where you can see the temperature inside the stars, sun surface, a few thousand K, room temperature, the cosmological background, which is around three Kelvin, and all the technologies of liquid helium, which bring you maybe down to a few milli Kelvin. With lasers, you reach in the mid 80s, Doppler laser cooling, which was a few 200 micro Kelvin, and then by sub-Doppler cooling techniques, the micro Kelvin range, and then from the micro Kelvin using evaporative cooling, I would say a few words about that, you get into the range of uh, uh, the uh, nano Kelvin. And if you take a look about the velocities of atoms uh, at room temperature in this room, the atoms are going at 500 meter per second, Doppler cooling bringing it down to meter per second and evaporative cooling to millimeter per second. As you know, the De Broglie wavelength is inversely proportional to the velocity, and so it means that you get into the range where atoms have a matter wave which extends over macroscopic distances, and this has very important consequences, and this lead to these new phases of matter. So how do you cool atoms? I don't have time to enter into details, but you realize counter-propagating beams of laser light, and the trick is to detune the laser slightly below the resonance, which means that due to the Doppler effect, the atoms will always interact more with the light which is coming towards them than the light which is in their back, and this gives rise to a force proportional to the velocity, a damping force. This is why we call the system optical molasses. The atoms are like uh, small pieces of matter inside the molasses and they come to rest at a very low temperature. Once you get, once you get this to this temperature, you can switch off the light and realize a magnetic trap. You realize gradients of magnetic fields which are strong enough to keep the atoms 
at the bottom of the trap because they are already cold. And now these magnetic traps are uh, working only if the atom is in the right magnetic sublevel. If it goes into the wrong sublevel, the force becomes anti-trapping. And this gives a very uh, uh, astute method to cool down even more. You apply a radio frequency field which is resonant only if the atom comes to the edge of the trap. Then they flip to the other state and they escape. This is called evaporative cooling. The, the fastest atoms escape and the rest re uh, thermalize by collisions. Of course, you have to do it in the right way because it, you, you must cool before losing all the atoms and this is why it took some time to realize. When you get to very low temperatures because of the the uh, wavelengths, as I explained, the wavelength increases. And if the atoms are bosons, and when the distance between them becomes of the order of the De Broglie wavelength, they condensate into the ground state of the trap. This is called Bose-Einstein condensation, which was predicted by Einstein in 1925 and observed for the first time with this cold atom in 1995. This is, the, the technique is uh, simple, simple, the principle is simple to explain. Once you, the system has got into this state, you switch off the trap, so the atoms will escape, and after a while you take a, a picture by taking the shadow of this expanding cloud, and this gives you a distribution of the velocities of the atoms when uh, the trap was switched off, and you see, you will see the picture which comes from the group of Cornell and Wyman, who were the pioneers, who were the first to observe that. You see in this movie what happens when the temperature goes down, and suddenly when you reach the threshold, you have a peak of atoms which, have, which are in the ground state. You just have the zero-point fluctuations of the trap, and you see you have two temperature scales, because as you go down in temperature, you lose atoms, and if you lose atoms, the temperature for the threshold increases because the double wavelength becomes uh, bigger and bigger. And so you have to you reach the threshold if you are uh, clever enough to uh, have uh, the temperature decreasing faster than the threshold of the Bose-Einstein condensation. And this made, of course, a cover picture of science in June 1995. It was a big breakthrough in atomic physics because this opened the way to a lot of uh, very beautiful and potentially useful experiments. If you let the BEC escape from the trap, you get a, b a coherent beam of matter waves, which is the equivalent of lasers, with the difference that the particles are not photons but atoms. And you have many, many experiments which have been done this way. And these beams can interfere with each other. You can build uh, gravimeters, you can build a gyroscope, and, uh, which use uh, these uh, beam of atoms. You can also do the same kind of experiment with fermions, particles which uh, uh, have an uh, odd number of, part of uh, fundamental particles in them. And for instance, if you work with lithium, which has an isotope, which is a fermion, an isotope, which is a boson, you can compare the properties of boson and fermions. If you have bosons, they will all condensate in the ground state of the trap. If they are fermions, you, must have, you can have only one atom per uh, uh, quantum state, which means that if you cool them, and this is an example comparing lithium-7 and lithium-6, if you cool a, a boson gas, it will become much smaller at a low temperature than the, than the fermion gas at the same temperature. And you can see in a kind of uh, visceral way the difference between boson and fermions and the effect of the Pauli uh, exclusion principle and, uh, <coughs> on this system. So you have a direct, you can really make textbook experiments. You can also see uh, the analogy with solid state physics. If you cool uh, bosons and fermions, they become superfluids at very low temperature. Boson, it's, the reason is clear. Fermions is because they pair, I, like in the BCS, uh, 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 Bardin Cooper Schrieffer uh, superconducting theory, pairs of fermions at very cold gases interact with each other and form loose, loose, loosely bound pairs which have bosonic properties. And you see that, for instance, if you make put the system in rotation, you see that the, the, uh, the ensemble does not rotate as a classical gas, it rotates as a quantum gas, which means that uh, vortices are formed, and in a vortex, the velocity is, becomes larger and larger as the center of the vortex, whereas in a classical gas, the velocity, of course, increases with the radius. And if you try to put more angular momentum in the system, 
more vortices form and, and the vortex, vortices interact with each other to form regular structures. And this can be done with bosons and with fermions. And this reminds us of the vortices arrays in superconductors of type two. Uh, in the case of superconductivity, the vortices are magnetic field lines. And in the case of uh, BC or fermionic gases, these are lines of rotation. And the analogy is clear. If you write the Hamiltonian of the system, you find that for atoms uh, and for superconducting electrons, the Hamiltonian has the same form, except that in the case of electrons, the magnetic field creates a Lorentz force. In the case of rotation, the rotation cre creates a Coriolis force, and the form of the Coriolis and the Lorentz form are the same, so you have the same physics. And this gives an interesting idea, the fact that you can simulate with these cold gases events which occur in solid state physics, and you can make artificial magnetic fields, for instance, and you can study a lot of effects which are difficult to study in condensed matter physics because you control less well the parameters. And another field in which this is becomes very, very uh, fruitful is to build optical lattices with laser beams uh, in two, one, two, or three directions and to trap atoms at the nodes of these optical lattices and you create artificial solids and study effects which would occur in the real materials at a completely different scale. And this is the domain of quant not quantum computing, but quantum simulation, which is developing very fast and very useful. A few words about detection sensitivity. This is again a picture of Kastler showing a sample which contains about 10 to the 10 atoms. And here you see the first picture showing a single atom. You see here a single barium atom in a trap. So you have a lot of scattering of light on the zillions of atoms that you have in, in the trap electrodes. And you see here uh, the magnitude of the light scattering effect. A single atom can compete with maybe 10 to the 22 or 10 to the 23 atoms because it is resonant, while the other one are not resonant. And this was first observed in the group of Peter Toshek in 1978 and then by Dave Wyman uh, in the United States, and again, 10 orders of magnitude. So single atom physics have opened a lot of interesting uh, things to study in quantum optics, for instance, if you have a single atom and if it, it can emit a lot of photons when it scatters the light from a laser. But the difference with a classical source is that once it has emitted a photon, it takes some time for it to be re-excited. And so you have a, a kind of time lag between photon emission. It's called photon anti-bunching. And it's a quantum effect which has been studied in the 1980s. The other important effect is the quantum jumps of a single trapped ion. You see here the structure. You have three levels. The atoms is scattering a lot of photons on this transition. And this is a forbidden transition with a second laser, which sometimes brings the atom from the ground to this shelving state. When this happens, there is a sudden interruption of the scattering of light on the other transition. And you see this as jumps of the, the light. This is now used routinely in all ion trap experiments. In the 1980s, it was very, uh, to some very surprising. There were many physicists who thought that quantum jumps did not exist. And uh, the most famous was Schrodinger, who wrote a paper in the 1930s uh, whose title was Are they quantum jumps with a question mark? In fact, he did not like at all this idea, but you see now that it has become common. And of course, if you do that with many atoms in a trap, you can study quantum entanglement and perform a lot of uh, toy experiments for quantum information process processing with ion strings. What is the connection with cavity QED? In fact, these ex cavity QED experiments and the ion trap are just the two sides of the same coin. In the case of ion trap, what you do is that you use electrodes to trap ions. And then you use laser beams to manipulate these, these ions. You use, first of all, the laser beam to cool the ions. And then, by looking at the scattered light, you get information about the quantum state of the ions. In uh, cavity QED, we do the opposite. We trap the light between mirrors, in fact, microwaves. And we send a beam of atoms across to extract information from the photons. Where is the laser here? Of course, the laser is used to prepare the atom. We don't use ground state atoms. We use Rydberg atoms, very excited atoms, 
which interact very strongly with microwaves. And uh, in both cases, we use light-matter interaction at the most fundamental level. And I want also to stress that it's, uh, it's called, what, it's not what we like to call in vivo physics, because we observe atoms without destroying them. This is maybe not so strange, but it's the, the, the stranger fact that you can also observe photons without destroying them. And this is uh, new because usually when you observe photons, uh, you destroy them by the photoelectric effect, of course. But here, we, the Rydberg atoms can be uh, used in a, to interact with atoms in a gentle way to extract information from the field without destroying the field. And this is what we have been doing in Paris. I don't have time to explain the details, but we can observe the quantum jump of light. You look at the photon field, you decide that you measure the number of photons by sending atoms across the cavity, and you find, for instance, four photons. And then after a while, it goes to three, to two, to one, and to zero. And the jumps are random. You cannot predict when they will occur. You can look at the statistics of these events, and you can see and observe and maybe use one day the quantum jumps of light. We can also prepare strange states of the radiation field. I, again, I don't have time to discuss that, but these are pictures which are kind of radiography of the field in the cavity. And you see these two peaks correspond to two fields which have opposite phases. And in between, you have fringes in this picture which express the fact that this, two, this superposition has a quantum mechanical coherence. It's a quantum state superposition. And as time evolves, the fringes are washed out. This is the phenomenon of decoherence. And so this is a kind of illustration of this uh, uh, Schrodinger cat uh, physics. You can prepare a system which is at the same time with one phase and the other, and suddenly it has to collapse into one or the other state. Of course, we see the two states because it's a statistical experiment. So this kind of experiment reminds uh, us of the uh, uh, photon box experiment that Bohr and Einstein discussed at the Solvay conference in 1927. You see in this experiment you have a box which contains photons and uh, you want to find out when the photons escape and for that you have a clock which triggers a shutter which opens or closes the box. I don't want to discuss in which context that they invented this but in fact we are doing something similar. We have a box and the Rydberg atoms are make the clock. In fact, we look at the phase, how the phase of the Rydberg superposition evolves, and this is equivalent to an atomic clock, and the measurement of this atomic clock gives us some information about the field in the cavity. So these are experiments that the founding fathers of quantum physics uh, believe would never be done. They considered it was just a way to, to think about quantum physics, and Schrodinger said, as, as you may have heard, we never experiment with single electrons, atoms or small molecules. In thought experiments, we assume that we do, and it always results in ridiculous consequences. So, so when I am asked why I am doing that, I say that half-jokingly that the main motivation is to prove Schrodinger wrong, that it's not the consequences are not ridiculous. Uh, what about the measurement of time? I would like to, again, to... Uh, insist on the orders of magnitude. So I will recall a little bit of history. In the 14th century, the time was measured by in, in churches by tower clocks. So you had, it was a torque on, 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 a, on a thread which was used and, and the, uh, the association of, a, of, of this horizontal uh, uh, rod. And the number of association was counted with, with a, a wheel. We, we, uh, wheel which has teeth in it. Uh, then, of course, there was an improvement with Galileo and Huygens in the 17th century. They replaced this very complicated system but just by a pendulum, and the escape mechanism was counting the oscillation of the pendulum and transferring them into the motion of the hand of the, of the pendulum. And then in the 18th century, there was an interesting development, which was to replace the pendulum by a spring, and this was a modern uh, watch. And it was a chronometer, in fact, and it was developed with high precision by Harrison. Uh, the aim is, was to be able to keep the time for long times in order to have this, to be able to carry this watch on ships and to keep the time of Greenwich or London or whatever when you were at a different longitude to measure the longitude. 
And then the next improvement came only in the 20th century. It was a quartz clock. It was which was transferring the oscillation of of uh, of uh, uh, a quartz cantilever or a quartz rod into an electric current using the piezoelectric effect. The principle is always the same. You have an oscillator which is coupled to an escape mechanism which counts periods and which also restores the energy because otherwise the, the, the oscillator would, would be damped. Let's compare the precision. The tower clock has an uncertainty of 10 minus 2. It was about one quarter of an hour per day. So it, you, you had to reset the time looking at the sun every day. Uh, the pa Galileo pendulum was a few seconds per day, the best one. You have to correct for, for contraction, for, for, for di uh, dilatation due to temperature and so on. But moreover, the pendulum cannot be carried on the ship. So it was not very good for that. The best uh, chronometers were one second per month. And this was good for navigation because one month needs a lot of time to go far. And the best piezoelectric clocks are one second per year. Per year, excuse me. So you see that in six centuries, the progress has been six orders of magnitude, one order of magnitude per century. In the last 50 years, we have added 10 more orders of magnitude in 50 years. So you see, and this is because of lasers, essentially, not only lasers, but quantum physics and lasers. So you see how, starting in the 1960s, the accuracy of clock has increased first using the cesium microwave clock and then optical clocks with a, dip, with, with a new slope. So the atomic clocks of 2015 are 10 orders of magnitude more precise than the best sports clocks of the 50s. They keep time with an accuracy of 10 minus 13 seconds per day instead of 10 minus 3. Of course, you, you know the principle of the, the first atomic clocks were microwave clocks. Again, uh, the heritage of Rabi. And Norman Ramsey was a student of, of Rabi and, and the mentor of, of Dave Wineland. So you see that one advice to get a Nobel Prize is to be in a, in a long lineage of uh, of scientists, uh, you see the principle of the clock is just it's, a, it's an atomic beam, a molecular beam, and the trick is to have now the, the field applied in two pulses instead of one, and then you have an interference effect, and instead of having just a Lorentz, Lorentzian line, you have fringes uh, when you sweep the frequency of the microwave, and if you can lock the microwave to the central fringe, you have a very stable source of microwave. And in the microwave domain, there are electronic means to count the frequency, so you have a clock. And this clock immediately gave an uncertainty of 10 minus 14 instead of 10 minus 8. So six orders of magnitude in one step, one nanosecond per day. And one nanosecond per day is very important because it means that if you reset the clocks every day, you have now a clock whose which can give a signal which will have an uncertainty on an, of only one, uh, one 30 centimeter per day. And this is why the GPS system is so precise. But of course, for the GPS system, you have to correct for all relativistic effects. So I, I, I take the GPS as a fantastic example of uh, a kind, an application innovation which uses fundamental quantum physics and fundamental relativity special and general relativity effects. Everybody uses that every day in daily life without any astonishment. And uh, everybody talks about social needs, the fact that you have to develop research because you have to, to help uh, solve problems. And in fact, the, the, you solve the problems without thinking about them. Einstein and Bohr and uh, Schrodinger never thought about the GPS. And this came after a long time of, of basic research. So what about the lasers? The lasers improved the atomic clock by two orders of magnitude just because you can use colder atoms which stay a longer time between the two pulses. And what you do is that you make an atomic fountain. You, you see here uh, the fountain, you, you, you prepare a cold gas of atoms with these beams and then you push the atoms up and on the way up and down they interact with the microwave twice. And you detect them when they come down in this laser beam by looking at the fluorescence of the atoms, which is different depending upon whether they are in the upper or in the lower state of the transition. And then you get very narrow fringes because the separation of the, the, the period of the fringes is inversely proportional to the separation time. And now you can count 
time with an uncertainty of 10 minus 16. But this is not uh, the ultimate. You can even go m do much better if instead of counting microwave, you count optical frequencies. And uh, the problem was how do you go down from optical frequencies to microwave and then to an electronic counter. And for that, uh, the breakthrough was, of course, the frequency comb developed by Ted Hench and John Hall. The idea is to lock, to have a multi-mode laser with a lot of modes and to lock them in phase together. And when you do that, uh, the phase-locked lasers give a train of pulses. You have an interference effect which beat, beats up the light at a very short time and then the light goes down and goes up. You have here a uh, picture in the frequency do in, in the uh, uh, yes in the frequency domain where you see how you the interference builds up this strain of pulses in the time domain what you can think of it as a kind of bullet of light go going back and forth between the mirror and escaping from one of the mirrors and gives a train of very short pulses each pulse has only a few oscillation of the light beam in it but if you add up all these pulses and look at the Fourier transform you find that it's a comb of very uh, well-spaced lines uh, in the spectrum, and you can cover an octave of light in this way. And the more I most important point is that you can lock the repetition rate to an atomic clock, and then you have a kind of ruler which gives you any frequency with the precision of the microwave clock. So the principle, for instance, this is taken from Ted Hench, uh, slide, you have a laser, you divide it into two parts. One part is sent to look at a line, for example, in hydrogen, and you lock this laser to the hydrogen line. And then the other beam is compared to a frequency comb, which is itself locked to uh, the cesium clock. So then you can make absolute measurement of atomic frequencies with a precision of 10 minus 13, 10 minus 14. But you can reverse the system, you can get rid of the cesium clock and use now the atomic uh, line itself, the atomic uh, system itself, as a way to lock the frequency comb. And now you have an atomic clock, uh, which is based on an optical frequency. And there are two kinds of clocks which are competing to be, uh, become the new time standard. One which is based on a single aluminum or magnesium ion. This is experiments which come directly from Dave Wynand's group. Or you can have a bunch of atoms in an optical lattice and lock a transition of these atoms, neutral atoms, to a frequency comb. The precision is now of the order of 10 minus 17 to 10 minus 18, which is one second in the age of the universe. It means that if you two clocks had started like that 14 billion years ago, they would not drift with respect to each other by more than one second. This also means that you can make general relativity experiments. If you take two clocks and if you bring one up by a few centimeters, the, the ticking rate of the two clocks would become measurable. In fact, this has been done with 33 centimeters, maybe because it was done in America, it was one foot. So one foot is enough to, uh, to see the difference. And this kind of clock could be used to, to see small uh, uh, mass inhomogeneities inside the Earth or to uh, make some kind of prevention. Uh, pre uh, warning before earthquakes because when, when there's small difference, small motion of masses inside it, the, the clock time will be different. Uh, now I see that I have no more time, but uh, I will conclude with the last topic I will not wanted to, to discuss, which is high power lasers and ultra short light pulses. And my excuse to go fast is that Ferenc Krauss will describe this this afternoon, and, and also I don't dare to talk in front of the, such specialists here and, and people working in this field. Uh, I just want to uh, stress the fact that the evolution in the peak power of laser has been strongly correlated to the shortening of the pulses. Just because in order to get short pulses, you need strong nonlinear effects which require power. And you see that there have been two times, two periods. The first period, which is due to essentially to mode locking, the effect I discussed, which increased the power tremendously. And then there was a plateau due to the fact that uh, uh, one reached the level at which uh, you are destroying the amplifying medium which was used to get more power, so it was not possible to go uh, to larger power. And this increase here was correlated to a decrease of the pulse length to a few femtoseconds. Then the same plateau occurred, 
And this happened because a technique called chirp per simplification was invented uh, by uh, Mo Gérard Mourou and uh, others about at the turn of the 19, at the end of the 1980s and a big increase occurred, and this is correlated to the decrease of the pulse length. And the next slide gives the principle of chirp, chirp pulse amplification. The amplifier here is a critical uh, element, so if you have a short pulse to start with, you start by, stre by stretching the pulse, making the red wavelengths going a shorter path than the blue one, and the stretched pulse can be amplified without damaging the medium, and after that you compress the pulse again and you get a huge pulse in which you, you, you have a lot of power. And this is a kind of pulse which are used for attosecond physics. So I defer to, uh, to Ferenc Krauss. I just re remind the principles that you just focus this huge power uh, of a sh very short infrared pulse on a gas jet uh, of a noble gas, for instance. And uh, the principle which has been developed by, uh, explained by Paul uh, Corcom back in the 1990s is that uh, what happens is that the first time the pulse reaches the maximum value here, it, an ele electrons are ejected from the atom by just by, by field, instantaneous field ionization. And this electron, which goes away, comes back on the atom when the light field reverses itself. And when it collides back with the atom, at this time, uh, there is a nonlinear process which produces a very high harmonic of the field and a very short pulse. And the important point is that you have now two pulses, the original infrared pulse and the very short pulse, and you can delay one with respect to the other. I do a lot of stroboscopic tricks that I don't have time to discuss, and one of the most, um, of the most spectacular result is, is this, uh, the fact that you can now take direct pictures of an optical field which oscillates at 10 to the 15, and you can use all th this kind of physics to as powerful probes to study ultra-fast electronic processes, and Ferenc will talk about that. So I think it's time to conclude. I want to come back to what I thought was a very important point, that AMO physics, which I must tell you in the 1960s was considered as a boring field. When I got into this field, a lot of my friends told me, but why are you going in atomic physics? You will take spectrum all your life. It's boring. You should go in particle physics. And I am glad that I stuck to AMO physics. It made connections with condensed matter. For example, artificial atoms are using all the technique of atomic physics to do uh, wonderful things. Cold atom simulates solid state system, as I said. There is a connection with astrophysics. A cold fermionic gas, degenerate fermionic gas, simulates a situation of neutron stars, which are made of fermions. You have a connection with particle physics. You can study s uh, weather interactions uh, viol symmetry are violated in atomic physics. You can also, uh, by comparing atomic clocks, see whether fundamental constants are varying with time, which has a connection with particle physics and cosmology. Atosecond physics makes a bridge with chemistry and biology. And, uh, of course, so you have a connection with, a connection with quantum information science. Last word of in conclusion, I, I want to stress the permanent dialogue between blue sky research and innovation. All of these stories started with the observation of nature. I remind you that quantum physics started with the observation of strange properties of light, like the photoelectric effect, which could not be explained classically. So this leads to theoretical models, like quantum theory, which predicts new effects, atom-photon interaction leading to the laser. So it leads to novel technologies which, which allow you to develop new devices, uh, laser interferometers, atomic clocks, and this gives you tools to perform more precise observation which confirm or falsify the theory. So this, I just want to uh, finish by acknowledging my co-workers. I have been working with Jean-Michel Raymond and Michel Boyne for many, many years, and this is a picture of our group on the top of uh, Collège de France. So you see that we are working in a nice environment with a lot of culture uh, beyond physics. In fact, there is a tower here which is a tower in which Pascal in the 17th century uh, uh, demonstrated for the first time the effect of the atmospheric pressure, the fact that atmospheric pressure decreases when you go higher in altitude. This is Tour Saint-Jacques. And I also want to say that I have had a long, long list of students and postdocs and co-workers over the last 40 years, and 
what I am most grateful and proud about is that about one half are foreign. They come from 20 countries, and this illustrates the international nature of science. And I will stop here and apologize for the delay. <laughs> Thank you.